furthermore, this explains one other thing. After you're done exercising, when you finish exercising, do you just stop like this? Or at the end of exercising strenuously, are you more like this? Well, why are, you, why are you continuing to huff and puff if you've already stopped exercising? And the reason why you continue to inhale this additional oxygen when you're already done exercising is because that lactic acid that accumulated when you were exercising must now be broken back down. It must be converted back to pyruvate sugar. How does that happen? The NADs grab the pair of hydrogens off the lactic acid, turning it back to pyruvate sugar, and now additional oxygen must be inhaled after the exercise so that those hydrogens can now be transferred to oxygen to form water. This, this idea of breathing additional oxygen when you're done exercising is called an oxygen debt an O2 debt. This is the term, an oxygen debt. That is related to the amount of lactic acid that accumulated in the muscles when you were exercising. The more lactic acid you accumulated in your muscles when you were exercising, the greater your oxygen debt is, and the more you will be breathing additional oxygen when you're done exercising. Now, one more factor, one more idea related to this. How come some people can run five miles before they start to get fatigued, and other people run one mile before they start to become fatigued, and some people run one block and they start to become fatigued? That has to do with primarily your heart and lungs, with the emphasis on your heart. The stronger your heart and lungs are, the more efficiently and effectively you can provide plenty of oxygenated blood to your active exercising muscles. If your heart is in good shape, you can deliver lots of oxygenated blood to your muscles, and your muscles do not produce very much lactic acid. If, on the other hand, your heart is not in very good condition, your ability to provide lots of oxygenated blood to your muscles is reduced and therefore your muscles don't get enough oxygen and they fatigue more quickly. Now let's look at the steps of aerobic respiration occurring in the mitochondria. <clears throat> aerobic cellular respiration occurs in the mitochondria of the cells and it occurs after anaerobic respiration, which occurred in the cytoplasm of the cell. Recall that in anaerobic respiration, in glycolysis, a glucose molecule was split apart, forming two three-carbon sugars called pyruvate sugars, or pyruvic acid. These sugars enter the mitochondria of the cell when oxygen is available. So here's the two pyruvate sugars. Remember, pyruvate sugars are also called pyruvic acid. They use those terms interchangeably. We have two of them. Now, aerobic respiration in the mitochondria involves three major steps or three major series of reactions. The first is called the transition reaction. The second is called the Krebs citric acid cycle. And the third is called the electron transport system. <clears throat> we'll take each of these three steps at a time. What is the transition reaction? In the transition reaction, each of the two pyruvate sugars is going to be split apart, forming two acetyl sugars. Each acetyl sugar is two carbon atoms big. We have two of them. Here's one, here's the other. Each one's two carbon atoms big. So it looks like if a three carbon pyruvate sugar was split apart, forming a two carbon acetyl sugar, that's what they're called, acetyl sugars, what's missing? What's missing is a carbon atom. A carbon atom is missing here, a carbon atom is missing here. We are missing two carbon atoms. What happened to these two carbon atoms? 
they have been turned into carbon dioxide. Each carbon dioxide has a carbon atom in it. Those are the two missing carbon atoms. You might say, is this supposed to happen? And the answer is emphatically yes. The entire purpose of cellular respiration was to break apart a sugar molecule into six carbon dioxide molecules for the purpose of releasing energy that was going to be used to make ATP. So, we are now breaking apart the sugar and forming carbon dioxide. Two carbon dioxides have been formed so far. Now, there's one other thing that has happened in converting the pyruvate sugars, the two of them, into two acetyl sugars, which are each two carbon atoms big. Uh, the, uh, the, the two carbon oxides have been formed, and the other thing that has happened is that two NADs, you'd say, who? You remember the niacin? The role of NAD, which contains the B vitamin niacin, is to transfer these hot potato hydrogen atoms off the sugar molecule as it's being broken apart, and its job is to transfer those hydrogens ultimately to oxygen. You'd say, well, can that happen now? Emphatically, yes, because these reactions occur only if oxygen is available. So we know oxygen is available, and each of these NADs, and there's two of them, each pick up a pair of hot potato hydrogen atoms, hydrogen atoms and electrons. And they're going to be transferring those hot potato hydrogen atoms to oxygen. We'll see where that happens in a moment. One last thing we can say about the transition reaction, which involves converting the three carbon sugars called pyruvates into the two carbon sugars called acetyl, and also forming two carbon oxides. What is this COA? COA stands for coenzyme A. It's just another coenzyme involved in these biochemical reactions of cellular respiration. What coenzyme, technic, coenzyme A technically is, is another B vitamin called pantothenic acid. It appears that many of these B vitamins have a key role in this cellular respiration process. Now, after these two acetyl sugars have been formed by the tr from the transition reaction, they then enter a complex series of reactions commonly known as the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. It's called that because it was named after Dr. Hans Krebs, who first described it and won a Nobel Prize for it. It's also called the citric acid cycle because it involves the use of citric acid. Yes, that same chemical that's found in orange juice, citric acid. <clears throat> the process is complex. Technically, technically, each two carbon acetyl sugar is attached to a four carbon oxaloacetate forming a six carbon citric acid which is then progressively split apart. But fundamentally, what's critically, what's critical and what's most important, each of the two acetyl sugars are going to be split apart in this Krebs cycle series of reactions. If you split a two carbon acetyl sugar apart, you form two carbon dioxides from it. If you do that to this acetyl sugar, and you do to, to this acetyl sugar, then what you end up with are four carbon dioxides. You might say, well, how did you get four? Again, there was a total of how many carbons altogether in these two acetyl sugars? One, two, three, four. Each of the two acetyl sugars has been split apart, forming four carbon dioxides.